starting. I'm starting the recording now. Um, there were a couple of people who weren't able to participate, and I said I would um, put it on the Peddler Press YouTube channel for anyone who's interested. So, um, so thank you. The book has this lovely image of a boy with very oversized heart and oversized brain on it. And in the background are bees. And uh, Henry Rattle's father is a beekeeper. So there's a lovely image by a Newfoundland artist, Anita Singh, who is a friend and uh, who gave me permission to use. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> So I don't see anybody waiting, so I'm just going to begin. The most famous story concerning master Japanese artist Sishu is the one which tells of his youth as an unruly boy whose instructor, in exasperation, ties him to a temple post whereupon the boy cries bitter tears. Using his tears as ink, he draws a rat in the dust, so realistic that it comes to life, gnaws the ropes and sets him free. It is afternoon. Edessa pulls a tissue from a box and blows her nose. In the mirror, a startling face, hers. She leans in and examines its grotesque proportions, eyes rimmed in red, skin blotchy and pale. The boy stands waiting. An unopened bottle of scotch sits on the sideboard next to a vintage ashtray. Wildflowers in a pink glass vase release their woodsy perfume. She pulls back from the mirror, opens the bottle with an aggressive twist, pours two fingers into a small juice glass, downs them. What was that you just drank? The boy asks. Glenn Livet. What's that? Booze. Are you going to drink more booze? I don't know yet. Do you drive your car when you drink booze? Sometimes. Were you drinking booze two weeks ago? Jesus. She moves to the door that leads into a short hall. The boy stands where he is waiting. She returns holding a map. As you were so inclined to draw me a map the other day, can you look at this one and tell me where we are and where Millionaire's Island is relative to where we are? What does relative mean in relation to? Like, near or far? Yes. The boy goes to the window that overlooks the lake. Millionaire's Island is over there, near. Edessa goes to the window and stands beside the small creature. Having been helpful, he is smiling broadly. She looks out in the direction of his raised finger. Where? Where the sun path ends. Sun path. Yes. He looks up at Edessa to see if his helpfulness has registered. Listen, let's go down to the dock again. I'll try to be more hospitable. Come share some digestive biscuits and cheese with the widow. The boy's happiness vanishes. He looks away. I understand how it's a widow. I understand that word. Wilson comes to the back door and the boy lets him in. The cat sits immediately at his feet, tail switching across the floorboards. Edessa is fetching another two fingers. The boy observes her profile in the mirror, seeing her reflected image as an other, a third presence, a woman arrested in the glass for that moment only, secretive, less certain, taciturn. She moves 
and the image falls away. She fills a small tray with cheese and biscuits, a plastic tumbler with orange juice. The boy holds the screen door open for her and they descend to the chairs on the dock facing the lake, its hanging and floating suns. The sun is misted, an impressionist painting, the forms of shore and wave, a wet transience of blurred pink and lavender. She cuts a piece of soft cheese, loads it onto a biscuit and hands it to the boy, then puts her thumb and index finger into her mouth and makes a sucking sound. Don't you think it's strange that we don't know each other's name? I'm Henry Rattle, Barry already told you my name. She ignores his logic. Well, how do you do, Henry? I'm Edessa Bloom. The boy looks carefully at her. Why are you drinking booze, Edessa? Look, I left the bottle up there. She waves her hand loosely in the direction of the cottage. I can't stay much longer. What's the big hurry? He had arrived at nine. And what is it now, four o'clock? She pushes an entire biscuit into her mouth and holds it there, her eyes rolling in mock astonishment. Henry laughs. I know that's rude. He watches as Edessa prolongs her chewing, regards her in silence as she rotates her jaw in slow, exaggerated motion, just as a clown might exaggerate eating. At last she swallows. When it comes to food and drink, I'm as rude as it gets. I have the biggest appetite in the kingdom. My God is my belly. Henry understood this with difficulty. You are very skinny. Are you going to have cheese with your biscuit or only a biscuit? No cheese. She looks away. Henry's biscuit lies untouched on the arm of his chair. Will you keep drinking after I'm gone? Now who's rude? There's one thing Baba knows and she never stops saying it. What is this indiscriminate belaboring of a point, Henry? She gets up from her chair and moves to the edge of the dock to watch the light play on the water. The man and his son fishing from a canoe. A swarm of black flies has amassed behind and above her head and neck, but she is oblivious to it. Henry observes their flight patterns. He removes his fountain pen from his back pocket, takes off the cap, and with its tip held high in the air, charts the frenetic impulses of the tiny bodies. Against the sky next to Edessa, he sees an intricate living map, imagines lines of black ink flowing restlessly. This is not the first time he has drawn movements of the world behind the back of an oblivious adult. He recaps his pen, returns it to his back pocket, sits still, hands cupped in his lap. In his front pocket, Henry has a sapphire ring. The ring had been his mother's. He could not recall ever seeing it on her finger, yet it recalled her to him perfectly. When she died last year, his father packed up all of her things, including the ring, and shipped them off to his aunt. The next time Henry saw his aunt, she gave him the ring whispering that his mother had wanted him to have it, repeating a puzzling phrase, beauty first. Don't tell your father, Henry. I'm sorry to be asking you to harbor a secret, but it's for the best. You're too young yet, but whatever. It was your mother's wish. How can I explain what this ring meant to her? It was our mother's. She was a remarkably beautiful woman. You look a lot like her. For a year, Henry kept the ring in its deep blue velvet case. 
To ensure its safety, he placed the case in a plastic Easter egg and hid that in a zippered bag his mother gave him for his eighth birthday, her last gift. That Henry's father would discover the ring has never been a threat. Broken by his wife's death, he no longer enters the places of Henry's life. For days now, Henry has carried the ring in his front pocket, fingering it as he approached Edessa. His constant worry, his constant compulsion to check for holes in his pocket, afraid he will lose the ring, could not be quelled. He wants to give her the ring. So overwhelmingly does he want this, so strongly has he wished to renew himself in her eyes. He had been the worst anyone could ever be to another. He had almost destroyed her. The ring is all he has to give, yet he resists giving it to her. She is a drinking adult, stealing first a little and then a lot more of the booze that turns adults into strangers. How come you're not eating? Henry does not reply. All the tears of his life are rising in him. I, never mind. Please come back another day. I want to be alone now. I can walk home. He says this to forestall any offer to drive him home. He will not get into her car if she has been drinking booze. He must be careful not to subject himself to violence or force. It isn't very far. I walk everywhere. I'm a walker. Well, all right, Henry Walker. See you soon, I expect. He turns and climbs the cottage drive to the road. His throat aches from holding back tears. He could throw something, a stone or a glass bottle. To keep the tears from spilling, to remember himself, and the ring, and the road. He names the trees as he runs past. Hemlock, maple, sumac, oak. A small rabbit on the path freezes when she sees him, then leaps away. Now, with your palms touching, spread your fingers in prayer. Then fold forward, hinging at the hip, letting your hands fall to the ground. Uttanasana. With your hands on the ground, float back your legs, keeping your elbows close to your chest, which remains raised above the floor. Chaturanga Dandasana. Roll on the tops of your feet, open the chest and straighten your arms. Urdhva Mukha Svanasana. Jump your feet lightly forward between your hands. Sorry, tuck your toes, push back, lift your hips, keeping your arms straight and your shoulders back, relax. Adho Mukha Svanasana. Jump your feet lightly forward between your hands. Straighten the legs and raise your back halfway up. Lift your head, then lower your chest to your legs. Uttanasana. Stand up all the way. Let your arms fall to your sides, then bring them to prayer. Samasti tihi. The body is not a throwaway item, Teresa says. She lowers her knees to her mat, sits back between her heels, arches her sacrum imperceptibly, then slowly curls her spine backward till her torso is outstretched on the floor, arms akimbo. How long it has taken, 15 years of daily practice to achieve this pose. Into the silence of Supta Vaj, Vajrasana, what Teresa calls lying thunderbolt, 
A raven coughs in a high treetop, its one note clear and exact. Sudden light fills the thinking mind. Chapter six. She stood a long time in front of the bottle, then moved away. Everything that could happen between her and Roger had happened. How was this possible? She had tried to receive him, take him in, incapable of understanding the nature of the overwhelming love she felt for him and why she had never truly reciprocated his love. Was this true? Yes, a fact. The fact of her past omissions was a torment. Midnight came on slowly, fog approaching in increments from the far side of the lake, sliding sleuth-like and elusive as if pausing to assess its own progress. 20 meters, another 20, pause, wait. She watched the night, gray, now lilac, now violet, the almost full moon rising behind the scrim of fog, its light breaking up, dispersing, a sailing halo in the violet vapor, shadows breathing. At long last, the fog cleared and a shimmering path of white light split the lake in two. The pilot of a commercial airline accompanies her to her seat along the cabin aisle before returning to the cockpit. The jet roars away from the gate, lifting with ease into the sky, locked and holding to a precise computerized route. From time to time, the pilot rises from his seat in the cockpit and visits passengers serene, jovial, with a grace he makes available to all. He leans over her, speaking profound nonsense, something about a child. He holds a mason jar that contains blue water. In it, many tiny creatures swim. One of the creatures is a girl with golden hair. The pilot points to her. Golden light shines round her. The pilot's face is illuminated. The jar tips, blue water spilling. The girl crawls out and stands. She speaks in strange, elevated, esoteric poetry about true love between two people. Another woman gasps and is immediately shushed. The girl begins to pick at her cheek with an instrument curved at one end like a crochet hook. The hook catches the flesh of her face, which is now loose as an old woman's. She draws flesh away as far as it will stretch, then lets it go, repeats. The passengers sitting closest can hear the slap of saliva in her mouth. If you want the truth, you must seek it, a man says. A prince leans over the seat to present the dreamer with a book of correctives. Day arrives, she lies on her side a pillow clutched to her belly, thoughts running skelter as she watches the light slide slowly across the lake, mauve rippling in black water, framed by trees and hills in black shadow, then rippling silver, gray, metallic blue against which lines of branch and leaf become visible. In the distance, she can hear the bark of a dog, the high tremolo, faraway claim of a loon. Rainwater drips close at hand into wet grass. Wilson lies next to her, his small head drifting. 
gone. The world beyond the room is now pink and abundant. She lies in a trance while a line of extraordinary mutating colors parades through and beyond the window. Dinner is hours away. She thinks she will make inquiries about a boat, a diver. Yes, rent a boat. She half rises from the bed. Wilson opens one eye. She shouldn't try to operate a boat when she is this tired. She drops back down. Wilson dozes. At noon, she rises to make coffee. Henry is outside, sitting astride a fallen log, his body turned away from the kitchen window. Tossing small stones into a green patch of sunlight, the stones make a soft tick against others. Tick, tick. He'll be waiting for a sound from inside the cottage. If she turns on the water or grinds the coffee beans, He'll know she is there, awake. Has he heard her footsteps? Can he see her, naked at the window, sodden air around her head? She places her right hand on her neck, feels the pulse jump in her jugular. If he were to knock, would she let him in? Maybe he'll get bored and go away. She could play possum outlast him maybe. She returns to the bed and sits cross-legged on top of the blankets. After a while, she experiences a painful contraction in her hips. She crawls under the covers, begins to weep. This cottage is a prison. Henry is only a boy, but he has her locked in. She cries herself to sleep. When she wakes again, it is four in the afternoon and Henry is gone. She feels ashamed. Something has surged and she failed to climb with it. She has had nothing more to eat than biscuits over many days and is too unsteady to walk or drive. She can't even concentrate enough to read a magazine. Everything is too goddamn much. No TV in the cottage, no radio. If she took a swim, she would surely drown. Why do people want to own cottages? It's like being held underwater. And yet, how perversely incompetent of her that she cannot think of a single thing to do. She feels as though her heart is narrowing while her body sags. She has already wept three times this day, but now she releases another flood of tears, her misery unrelieved. Chapter seven. You were reading Pilgrim at Tinker Creek when Edessa walked by beneath your window. Where was Henry, who usually accompanied her from morning till night? Oh, there, in the shallows. She is heading toward him. He is pretending to fish. I am not washed and beautiful in control of a shining world in which everything fits, Dillard wrote, but instead am wandering odd about on a splintered wreck I've come to care for. I am no one, find the zero. Then two days passed and Edessa did not come out of the cottage. Henry came each day and each day waited faithfully, pitching his stones. From time to time, he heard her moving around inside. Sometimes the pump would run for half a minute, then stop. He imagined her showering or making a cup of coffee. He did not think she would cook. He listened carefully for the sound ice makes 
when cubes clink against one another in a glass. The sapphire ring was in his pocket. He felt for holes. He thought about his mother, her wonderful face floating above him in the sky. The pitched stones knocked against each other. Women such as his mother and Edessa, beautiful, pent up. He could not get near them. The clouds and the sky and the lake are beautiful. When blue is involved, everything is beautiful. Otherwise, things can be dreary, depressing. Drawing is beautiful. But more than any of his finished drawings, the act of drawing is beautiful. Waiting, anticipating, these are terrible. This waiting at Edessa's back door was like wanting to run in two directions at the same time. On the third day, late in the afternoon, Edessa rapped on the window pane. Henry's head snapped around. She pointed he should go to the side door. She held the door open, inviting him in. Well, my little soldier. Henry bent to remove his sneakers. Wilson came into the room and sat down. First, my destroyer. Now my sentinel. What gives, Henry Walker? Henry stood by the door, barefoot, excitement coming alive. You won't like me asking, but why aren't you in school? He looked down. How had he not anticipated this? He should have been ready. If he had expected the question, he'd have been ready with a convincing lie. He was flummoxed. I don't need school. I see. Edessa looked at his downturned mouth. You think you have what it takes to forego the rat race? He bit at a cuticle on his thumb. What's a rat race? The rat race, my young scholar, is what most people run so as to be able to give something good to loved ones at the end of the day. The rat race is a nasty, all-consuming rut where you eventually stop thinking about loved ones or about anything, really. Henry looked up. She was changed. He did not know how exactly, but she was different. There was fight in her, which was different from the Edessa who had served him biscuits and orange juice on the dock. She was not drinking at the moment. He came farther into the cottage to an armchair by the window. Wilson followed, his tail high and curling. My mother died last year when I was eight. My father is a beekeeper. I see. He dessa crossed the room and sat down opposite Henry in an old rocking chair. I want to show you something. I've been waiting to show you something. Okay. Here. He was standing, reaching into his pocket, taking hold of the ring. He moved toward her and dropped the ring into her opening palm. He stepped back to observe. She didn't say anything, just rocked back and forth in the chair, turning the sapphire this way and that in the light. Her feet were bare. She wore a light summer shift. The tendons in her ankles moved up and down as the balls of her feet pushed against the floor. Blood was rushing into her face now, reddening the skin. Her mouth pursed. She held the sapphire up, partially obscuring her face from full view. Tears streaming down her flushed cheeks. He could not imagine what she was thinking. Put it on. She continued to hold the ring aloft. Inside Henry, 
in the room where voices gather. A voice was telling him he should not be giving his mother's ring to a stranger, especially not an adult who drank. Do you like it? He asked to get clear of the voice. She looked at him through her tears, but did not reply, only held his gaze. There was comfort in that odd moment as tears continued to drain her heart. He looked at her directly, standing quietly next to her, corners of his mouth downturned. She closed her palm into a fist and clutched the ring to her chest. It's for you. There are winds that upbraid us 40 knots for the gale. On water, foam will generate in well-marked wind rows. On land, small branches begin to break. I'm very moved, Henry, but I can't accept such a gift. He faltered, you must, please try it on. It's a beauty ring. He took a step forward and placed his small hand on her bare upper arm. When you had your hands on your knees in the ditch and you were rocking back and forth because you were angry, I looked at your finger and the ring was on it. So I know you're the one to give it to. <laughs> Bewildering words. He could not elaborate even when she pressed him. He closed his mouth, tightened his lips, would say no more. She sighed. Slowly, carefully, she placed the sapphire on the, right, on the ring finger of her right hand. Henry let out a little exclamation of pleasure. You see, it fits you perfectly. He lunged toward her, wrapping his arms around her with such happy force that the chair rocketed backward and he slid down into her lap. They both started to giggle. Henry Walker, it seems you are irresistible. My name is Henry Walker. His words in her lap were a jumble of unintelligible sound. He lifted his face, collecting himself and stood up. My name is Henry Rattle. He spoke clearly, precisely. I'm nine years old and I lied about school. Edessa laughed. Henry looked at her, alert. You'll keep it, won't you? She took his hand. I won't miss it, he began to plead. I won't miss it because you'll wear it and I'll see it every day. Edessa's expression became solemn. As extraordinary as Henry seemed to be, he was a child, innocent of the future. Her inevitable departure could not be clear in his mind. But better not to speak of that now. Better hold her tongue. Henry Rattle, whatever and whoever you appear to be, you'll be something other later and likely you'll change your mind 100 times. No, I stop. Yes, I'll wear it for now. His happiness sprang into the room, fully returned. And again, he dropped into her lap, this time with strength, wrapping his arms tightly around her waist. Hesitantly, she placed a hand on his dirty, tousled hair. Thank you. There you go. Um, now we're unmuted. Yeah. Here's Hi, Gary. Hi. I'm going to tell you one thing. Like now, I, I, I actually just finished the last slide of the book about four hours ago. And I must say, uh, when can you do an audio book? Because it is so different when you read it. Yeah, it's so different. What way? What do you, how in did, terms of the delivery of the lines? When it's so, um, I read, I, 
I'm reading it fast in my brain. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so when I hear this thing, and it's, it's sometimes it's hard to get this thing right. Who's talking to who, what, where, when, when you do it, it's clear as it's, it, it makes more sense to me. Right. So, how, so how do I go back and look at it from that perspective? Cause it's totally different. Well, I mean, I think that's one of the joys of readings. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to do a sustained reading because a lot of people who, you know, aren't used to reading works that are a bit experimental, yeah. um, had difficulty with the voices. Yes. Like at the beginning, especially who was speaking, you know, when, and, um, it, come, it comes very naturally to me to read Henry's voice as I just did. You know, you could tell immediately I was Henry because I feel the youth of him in me, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, actors must feel like this. But I, I just think that's what readings are for, is to really hear the author's voice. Yes, because I did have that thing where I spend a lot of time in the beginning trying to figure out who's saying what where before getting into into some part of the paragraph or whatever and then it was almost like a detective novel figuring a detective thing figuring out who was speaking where and then you get into the rhythm of it mm -hmm. and then you can you can then you get the prose and you get the, and then you get the speaking parts and you get the thing uh but i'm telling you I've got to do it again because that was so clear to me. It was different. Well, I'm so glad that you came to hear when you've just yeah. finished reading the book. Yeah, that yeah. Means, that means a lot to me. Thank you. Well, you're welcome because it's uh, it was really cool. Thank you, Beth. I do have a, a, a just a comment and then a question. Um, I love the way you read this story, and I want to put the emphasis on story. Your the story demanded a storyteller. <laughs> and, and you put it together by being that storyteller and made it much more poignant and easier to see the growth. And I love the fact that you went back and forth in time as well, because, you know, our memories go back and forth and they're not always in the chronological order. So, um, yeah, it was lovely. Thank you. Bless you. You had a question, though? Well, I'm not sure of the question. I, I'm trying to get into storytelling myself. You know, I, I, um, I'm retired, so, you know, I'm doing things. <laughs> um, I think it might be easy for a storyteller if they're engaged themselves with the story. Did you feel that way when you read? I mean, was it as fresh for you reading it the way you had written it? Yeah, well, I find I get moved quite often as I read. A lot, you know, um, the writers here know that the characters begin to live within you. And... Um, you know, I, I suppose they'll probably stay with me for the rest of my life. So I feel honored to be telling their story. And there is really that distance between them and me. Yes, I'm the author. Yes. But, um, you know, one of the ways that I could tell the novel was coming to completion is that they felt whole to me, you know, the characters felt as whole as anybody living that I know. And so I, I do feel that I'm very much telling their story, Edessa's and Henry's in particular, but all of theirs and the lake too. And uh, yeah. I got to tell you because the lake, because um... And I'm reading it, I'm going, wait a minute, Baptiste Lake, are you kidding me? 
um, because I know Bancroft. Uh, my my father had a a house in Lake Saint Peter. That's where where he uh, sort of retired. So we were there around Maynooth. So I was very familiar with all these places, and I thought that was just what are the chances of that being in Newfoundland for God's sake, right? <laughs> anyway, so so and College Street and. You know, uh, college in Bathurst, uh, I had did a restaurant there, designed a restaurant there, did all these things. So all these things are so familiar. And I'm wondering how those specific references to those of you who don't have them, how did you, did you connect with those on a city level or anything like that? You know what I mean? I connected uh, uh, specifically uh, with the college in Bathurst. Um, yeah, but I'm saying somebody who wasn't from, it didn't have that Toronto experience or that, could they see that as any town and 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 the blackout and, and knowing that whole thing? And uh, so I'm wondering if everybody else, because it's specific to a, a, a regional place in terms of, you know, the narrative, uh, that stuff, because we know it. But what if we didn't know it? And I'm thinking about other books where I get the feel of the place. And I, I think I did. But the point is, I already have that experience, so I know it. So I'm wondering if anybody else here doesn't know those areas, but still had that same feeling of knowing where you were in a city. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I was going to add, Gary, that uh, um, I placed myself in a setting that I knew that in my, in my mind, was exactly the setting that the author had written. Yep. Uh, but it wasn't that same place. So. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it is sort of a universal thing. And even the names, even though they ring true to me, it could be somewhere in New York saying a, a, you know, Park Avenue or something. And I would still turn that back because I have a city experience or something. Do you know? I, mean, I thought that was interesting just because I know the stuff, right? So there you go. There's... Uh... There is part, part of it is set in New York. Yep. And uh, I've read this book many times. And uh, well, I've been to New York, but not in the particular way that Beth uh, places a, a reader in New York. Um, for me, it seems to me uh, this, this, uh, th these places happen on the page. They happen that, that way for me anyway. So I didn't need to be there. I have been to some of these places, but uh, I didn't find myself thinking, you know, here I, I recognize this place and that place. I just felt like I was encountering them in the book. And the, the other thing I want to say, it's unrelated to this, is that I'm trying to say in the chat how proud I am <laughs> of Beth in this book, and I don't seem to be able <laughs> ever... <laughs> say anything in the chat so here it is well, there you go i tell you what because i am too and i just read i'm going like just you know because again the narrative the way it's written in the and stuff and like i saying it just when you read it geez and now i'm going to go back and read it again and hear your voice in my head reading it because now i have this one little thing that i was struggled with at the beginning at the end no i knew who was speaking when and where i got it's funny how you slip into that over a period of time uh, and so, okay, when I knew that, that when, when, when a, a section or a chat was starting, I could tell who was speaking, whereas in the beginning, I had to sort of wait until later on in, in, in to figure out who it was and then, okay, go back and relate it to the events and whatever. So I, 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 yeah, I think it deserves a, uh, yeah, another read pretty soon. So there you go. Well, you know, I was operating Edler for 25 years. And yeah. through those years editing, and I give readers a ton of credit for yeah. being able to start to create their own uh, imagined universe from the book, you know? So I know every single reader has a different kind of perspective on just exactly where Henry and Edessa and Barry and Teresa are and what the ashram is like, you know, but yeah. I know that, and poets know this, it can be a light touch 
you don't have to say over much before the imagination of the reader becomes engaged. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I tend to um, admire more minimalist kinds of uh, novels, fiction, um, story, I, you know, so you didn't see a lot of description, not not terribly much. There is description, but um, I just know that people are going to fall into the rhythm. If they don't give up, if it doesn't scare them, you know, after three pages and they put it down, yeah. I, I knew that people were going to be able to enter. Well, that you're just you hit the nail on the head because that's what happened to me. I was going, okay, I don't, okay, I don't get it. That oh, okay, and then I slipped into the rhythm, which made I sense had, to me. Um, my mom is ninety six years old, and um, lives in Winnipeg in a seniors residence. And the last time I was in Winnipeg was in February, March of 2020. And she really was getting increasingly sad about the idea that she wasn't gonna be able to hear, to read the book. Like she can't read, she, or she's not able to see well enough now, but sometime in May of this year, after the book had been released, I asked her if she would like me to read it out loud to her. Yeah. And she did. So over a number of phone calls, that's what we did. And it was a, a daughter's delight when she interrupted yeah. me at one point to say, I can see this lake. I, I'm there with you. I'm there. This, she says, you write very well. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah. it, it was just really uh, so wonderful to have mom tell me that she was lodged in the book and we were reading it this way, right? Over the phone, across the miles. Uh, I think once when I was reading a yoga passage she fell asleep <laughs> only briefly and you know i had to say to her look you know people in meditation fall to sleep so yeah. you know you're, you're doing the right thing but um you know the more readers a writer hears from the more confidence a writer has to keep trying new things or or yeah no yeah Hi, Beth. Uh -huh. Say a Hello. few words. Yeah. Hi. This is absolutely fabulous, and I really appreciate being part of this. And you. You know, your voice is so familiar to me, having known you for so many years. I can just imagine your mom, too. So what a wonderful description of, of you reading that book to her. I'm sure she found it really delightful. Yeah. So mentioned rhythm, rhythm of the book, and I've been thinking about that. One of the things I didn't do was I didn't read it yet because I wanted to wait to hear you read and I'm so glad because now I will have your voice in my head when I read it. And rhythm was really important for me in hearing this. It felt extremely meditative to hear your voice. Very um, kind of intense, but also relaxing at the same time. So I appreciate that. And the overall experience for me is feeling quite relaxed, even though there's intensity in what your, your writing is about and, and how you're reading it. I'm still feeling almost like on a wave with you while you're reading it. So it was quite a moving experience. Great, thank you. Very pleased and, and proud of you. Good job. So this should there be something where we all have the author read a bit before we buy a book so we can figure it out <laughs> and then enjoy it more. But, you know, again, I agree with you there. I Now I've got, I have my own voice when while reading it but that, hearing beth do it and then that just just ah no no i i really liked it and now i'm gonna do it again with with again with her because you, you have that thing now where you have this cadence or this thing or this slowness which is what i was trying to say 
when I read it, I'm when you wrote the passages, it was it, I got to read like that. How can I read like that? Hey, yeah. Beth, can I ask you a question? Of course. Uh, I, I've heard you mention twice now uh, as a kind of provision to reading your book if they're not scared by it or frightened by it. So I'm just curious what you think might be frightening about your book because I don't find it frightening at all. I find it beautiful and, and lovely and, and engaging. Well, uh, you know, I've heard people say it's difficult. Um, the unfamiliarity of the narrative breaking apart as it does the shift in pronouns from third person to second person for Barry. Um, I think some readers feel very challenged by these things and it maybe triggers them to feel like they aren't up to it. Is that agreeable they, to you to do that? Is it agreeable to me that people feel this way? Yes, and that you do that, knowing that that effect might happen. Well, it didn't happen to everyone. No, not it to happened, me. <laughs> it happened to some people. Uh -huh. um, I can't be responsible for every reader that might uh, pick up and begin to read instructor, but... Um, I think maybe I should uh, rephrase the question. Do you find yourself cultivating that kind of fluidity in your writing, just re uh, without any regard for how it might be received negatively? Yeah, well, I think I write for myself, Michael. Uh, you know, I, I, yeah, I've read a lot of. Uh, Stan and I read one of Mary Claire Blais Swath novels together. He read it out loud. Nice. I'd had the privilege of reading three already. So it was my fourth of her series. Stan hadn't read any. And um, I love it. You know, I, I'm uh, enthralled by these original styles, you know, I just find that for me, mm, the pleasure, the deep pleasure of the mind and of the body that I get from these kinds of texts make me want to do it also, you know, that, yeah. and, you know, let's face it, Mary Claire Blay, you know, she's hugely known mm -hmm. and very little re read. Right. Because um, people aren't always reading for the reasons that I read, you know, and that has to be respected. Sure. But I, I don't read for escape or entertainment or even for information. I read for delight. You know, it's, it's something that, I mean, I love Virginia Woolf's writing. Sure. And it, it's very difficult to explain in words the feelings that come over me when I read these kinds of works. All I know is that more and more I want them and less and less I want commercial, you know, sure. what is more palatable, I suppose. We and um, you have to know where you are in the spectrum of writers. I think it's very important to know. Okay what kind of a writer you are. And, you know, in the book, in, in Instructor, at one point early on, I have Barry Grew say, she knows what kind of an oddball she is. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, that's Beth Follett <laughs> coming up through the text, right? Hallelujah I know, to that. <laughs> I know what kind of oddball I am. And um, me too. Jen, <laughs> and my sister Debbie just put her hand up too. I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, so I'm not going to, like, can I write some other way? No, this is how I write. Yeah. And um, this was such an interest. I mean, you write. Uh, you must know how odd you are too. But I certainly do. Yes. <laughs> I just want to just say something to Debbie. Michael Boyce is the author of Monkey, and it was Monkey that Michael read to Kathy at Riverview, the last book she, my sister Kathy, heard. Wow. Uh, because her son. Debbie and my nephew, Michael, read it aloud to her when she was in palliative care. Wow. And, um, you know, all the way through, Michael's trying to decide <laughs> <laughs> what's happening. But he, you know, like Gary with Instructor, he began to really dig it. And he just persisted Thank way you. past the time when I'm sure Kathy was getting anything much. Thank you. But he was getting a lot, you know, and, uh, you know, I think he is a, a person who wants to have experiences that aren't the same old every day. You know, he wants that. And it was yes. for him a pleasure that he was encountering something that he'd never read anything like it before. Thank you for that story. Yeah. It's exciting to read works such as you're referencing uh, because it's inspiring. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you've indicated that by the authors you've, you've mentioned, whose works you enjoy, that they're generative for you, which is to say that they provoke you to write, to produce that same beauty first, if you will, to mm -hmm. quote your, the quote from your book. I mean, it's not quite as direct as you just said. You know, when I read Mary Claire Blay, I'm not thinking about my own writing. I'm mm. thinking about my own life. Mm. I'm thinking about this world. I'm, I'm, I'm not thinking about my writing. But doesn't it spur you? Absolutely has an impact, you yeah. know. Well, I'm getting quite quite a good I'm taking notes to get a good reading list here. See, see, that's good. <laughs> because you this is my thing. This is what this is. This is my my. You know, that's what I go for. You know. <laughs> so I'm just kind of branching out a little bit more. You know, <laughs> that's way to go, stuff. Gary. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm. I am. Well, about time. <laughs> well, there are writers on this Zoom like Julie Brook whose work uh, everyone should read. And, um, you know, I don't know if you consider yourself an oddball, <laughs> Julie. I guess that's a question. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely an oddball.